Hello and welcome to our video summarizing all you need to know about the history of Lebanon. My name is Sarah and today I'm going to cover the independence of Lebanon, its civil war, the Cedar Revolution, along with the withdrawal of Israel and Syrian influence. This video is really useful, especially if you are studying Lebanon history as part of your coursework or exam, as I'll get into the details you need to know to get top marks. So let's get started. So first, let's take a look at the long path to independence. Between 1919 and 1943, when France took control of Lebanon after the First World War, the area differed from the rest of the Arab world because it had a mix of Muslims and Christians, with the latter in the majority. The country adopted a constitution that created a parliament with a president and prime minister. To satisfy the political demands of the two main demographic groups, a compromise was reached whereby the president was always to be Maronite Christian and the prime minister a Sunni Muslim. As in the other nations during this time, the true ruler remained the mandatory power, in this case, France. Neither the Muslims nor the Christians were content under French control and strong sentiment existed for unification with Syria. Whenever unrest threatened the nation's stability, the French would crack down and restore order. In 1919, on October 27th, a Lebanese delegation, led by Maronite Patriarch, the Lebanese aspirations in a memorandum to the Paris Peace Conference. This included a significant extension of the frontiers of the Lebanon Mutasarifate, arguing that the additional areas constituted natural parts of Lebanon, even though the Christian community or Maronites would not be clear majority in such an enlarged state. The quest for the annexation of agricultural lands in the Bakay and Akar was fueled by existential fears following the death of nearly half of the Mount Lebanon Muntasarifate population in the Great Famine. The Maronite Church and the secular leaders thought a state that could better provide for its people. The areas to be added to the Muntasarifate included the coastal towns of Beirut, Tripoli, Sidon, entire, and their respective hinterlands, all of which belonged to the Beirut village together with four casas of the Syria village. As a consequence of this, the demographics of Lebanon were profoundly altered, as the added territory contained people who were predominantly Muslim or Druze. Lebanese Christians, of which the Maronites were the largest subgrouping, now constituted barely more than 50% of the population, while Sunni Muslims in Lebanon saw their numbers increase eightfold and the Shiite Muslims fourfold. The modern Lebanon's constitution, drawn up in 1926, specified a balance of power between the various religious groups, but France designed it to guarantee the political dominance of its Christian allies. The president was required to be Christian, the prime minister a Sunni Muslim. Based on the 1932 census, parliament seats were divided according to a 6 to 5 Christian Muslim ratio. The constitution gave the president veto power over any legislation approved by parliament, virtually ensuring that the 6.5 ratio would not be revised even if the population distribution changed. When the Vichy government assumed power over French territory in 1940, General Henry Fernandez was appointed as High Commissioner of Lebanon. This new turning point led to the resignation of Lebanese President Emile Ede on April 4, 1941. After five days, Dantz appointed Alfred Nakash for a presidency period that lasted only three months. The Vichy authorities allowed Nazi Germany to move aircraft and supplies through Syria to Iraq, where they were issued against British forces. Britain, fearing that Nazi Germany would gain full control of Lebanon and Syria by pressure on the weak Vichy government, sent its army into Syria and Lebanon. 
After the fighting ended in Lebanon, General Charles de Gaulle visited the area. Under various political pressures from both inside and outside Lebanon, de Gaulle decided to recognize the independence of Lebanon. On November 26, 1941, General Georges Catroux announced that Lebanon would become independent under the authority of the Free French Government. In 1943, a Lebanese flag was drawn and approved by the members of the Lebanese Parliament during the Declaration of Independence. Elections were held in 43, and on November 43, the new Lebanese government unilaterally abolished the mandate. The French reacted by throwing the new government into prison. In the face of international pressure, the French released the government officials on November 22, 1943, and accepted the independence of Lebanon. Although France lost its privileged position, Lebanon remained especially close to the West and was particularly interested in maintaining good relations with the United States. This goal was complicated by American support for partition, which the Lebanese opposed both rhetorically and militarily. The history of Lebanon since independence has been marked by interchanging durations of political stability and mayhem combined with prosperity founded on Beirut's location at the Regional Center for Trade and Finance. In 1948, a wave of Palestinian refugees came to Lebanon following the Arab-Israeli War and the establishment of Israel, increasing Lebanon's population by over thousands. The influx of migrants into Lebanon further complicated its religious divides. In 1958, during the last months of President Kami Shamoun's term, an insurrection broke out and 5,000 United States Marines were briefly dispatched to Beirut on July 15th in response to an appeal by the government. After the crisis, a new government was formed, led by the popular former general Fouad Shehab. During the early to mid-60s, Lebanon enjoyed a period of relative calm, with Beirut-focused tourism and banking sector-driven prosperity. Lebanon reached the peak of its economic success in the mid-60s. The country was a bastion of economic strength by the oil-rich Persian Gulf Arab states, whose funds made Lebanon one of the world's fastest-growing economies. This period of economic stability and prosperity was brought to an abrupt halt with the collapse of Youssef Beida Sintra Bank, the country's largest bank and financial backbone, in 66. In 67, a second wave of Palestinians come to Lebanon after the outbreak of the Six-Day War. Yasser Arafat's Palestinian Liberation Organization uses the country as a base for attacks on Israel. A year later, in 68, Israel attacked Beirut airport, destroying 13 Arab airliners in retaliation for what it claimed was Lebanese support for Palestinian terrorists. Regular Israeli attacks on Lebanon continued for the next six years. Then, between 1975 and 1990, a civil war in Lebanon broke out. So first of all, it was because of demographic tensions. In the, two dec- in the two decades leading up to the civil war, Lebanon was threatened by tensions between Maronite Christians and Muslims. Structurally, Lebanon is a state composed of communities whereby one community can never dominate the rest. This balance of power forced into Lebanon democracy as the best solution between the different communities. Then, a class between communities. The class income distribution between the sects was a key factor in the provocation of the civil war. As Beirut became a prominent financial sector in the Middle East in the 60s, Lebanon witnessed class inequality on the rise among the different communities. This provoked the major Lebanese sect leaders to mobilize the masses against each other in class-based conflict. 
To the Christians, Lebanese nationalism was strictly Lebanese and nothing else, whilst the Muslims regarded Lebanese nationalism as a complementary to Arab nationalism and did not mind having both. This would play a major role in the different factions who would ally with the Palestinians. These double standards of nationalism would threaten the Christian sense of Lebanese independence. During the 60s and 70s, the Palestinian Liberation Organization violated Lebanese sovereignty to attack Israel. Lebanese society is polarized as the Muslim minority feels powerless and allies itself with more powerful Muslim forces such as the PLO and the Syrians. In April 1975, battles between the PLO and the Qatar Christian militia spread to parts of Beirut, especially the downtown area which is totally destroyed leading to the demarcation line between the two parts of the city. Many militias are formed on both sides and hundreds of civilians are killed or taken hostage. The government divides and the army is split. The militias usurp many functions of the state. On January 76, the Quarantina and Damour massacres take place. In May 76, Elia Sarkis is elected president of Lebanon. The Tel al zatar massacre occurs. The Syrian army intervenes for the first time. On October 76, an Arab League commits an Arab League Com- An Arab League summit occurs to instill a ceasefire backed by the deployment of peacekeeping troops. Between February and March 78, the Hundred Days War begins and the ceasefire ends. The, Uni- the United Nations sends troops and foreign powers deploy aid to the two sides of the war. On February 79, the Iranian Revolution occurs, helping to radicalize the Shiite movement in Lebanon. In July 19, Bashir Jmael, leader of the Kateb militia, unites all the Christian militias by force, putting in place the political party Lebanese forces. Between July and September 82, the Lebanon war occurs as well as the siege of Beirut. Bashir Jmael is elected president on the 23rd of August and assassinated on the 14th of September. Soon after the Sabra and Shitaila massacre occurs, the Israeli withdraw. Amin Jermail is elected president. In April 83, United States embassy bombing occurs. During the summer of 83, the mountain war begins, and in 1983, on October, Beirut barracks bombing occurs. On February 1984, the Lebanese army, after controlling Beirut since Israeli withdrawal, is expelled from West Beirut, accused of partisanship with the Lebanese forces, and mass arrest. The Amal Party and the Druze Progressive Socialist Party take control of West Beirut. The multinationals withdraw from Lebanon. On February 85, the Israelis withdraw from Sidon but remain in the south. Armed resistance to Israeli occupation intensifies, especially from Hezbollah, the war of the camps arises. In March 1985, assassination attempt on Hezbollah leader Mohammad Hussein Fadlala. Between June and December 87, Rashid Karami is assassinated on June 1, 1987. The first intifada begins and the anger towards Israel and in Lebanon increases. There are hundreds of Lebanese and Palestinians imprisoned by Israel. On September 88, Amin Jemayel's presidential term expires and he appoints the commander of the army. On March 1989, General Aoun declares war on the Syrian presence in Lebanon. After seven months of shelling, a ceasefire is negotiated by the Arab League. 
Between October and November 89, the Taif Agreement occurs. René Mouad is elected president and assassinated 17 days later. Elias Hawi is then elected. General Aoun denounces the legitimacy of these presidencies and a new commander of the army is appointed. In January 1990, heavy fighting begins between the Lebanese army, still under General Aoun's control of the Lebanese forces, as well as fighting between Amal and Hezbollah, a continued resistance to Israeli occupation and Israeli reprisal raids. On October 90, General Aoun is forced out of the presidential palace and goes into exile. The October 13th massacre occurs. Selim Hoss assumes command of the country except for the part still occupied by Israel. The armed forces are reunited under a central command. On December 24th, 1990, a national reconciliation is formed under the leadership of Omar Karami. For the first time, the tariff agreement is put into place. Since the end of the war, the Lebanese have conducted several elections. Most of the militias have been weakened or disbanded, and the Lebanese armed forces have extended central government authority over about two-thirds of the country. It is estimated that around 150,000 people were killed and another 100,000 permanently handicapped by injuries. Approximately 900,000 people, representing one-fifth of the pre-war population, were displaced from their homes. Perhaps a quarter of a million emigrated permanently. Only Hezbollah retained its weapons and was supported by the Lebanese parliament in doing so, as they had defended Lebanon against the Israeli occupation. Syria, on the other hand, kept its military presence on most of Lebanon, also holding various government institutions in the country, strengthening its occupation. The social and political divisions that gave rise to and sustain the Lebanese civil war remain largely unresolved in its aftermath. Parliamentary and more recently municipal elections have been held with fewer irregularities and more popular participation than in the immediate aftermath of the conflict, and Lebanese civil society generally enjoys significantly more freedoms than elsewhere in the Arab world. However, there are continuing sectarian tensions and unease about Syrian and other external influences. So between the year 2000 and 2005, there was a withdrawal of Israel and Syrian influence. On May 25th, Israel completed its withdrawal from the south of Lebanon in accordance with the UN Security Council Resolution 425 a 50 square kilometer piece of mountain terrain, commonly referred to as the Shiva Farms, remains under the control of Israel. The UN has certified Israel's pull-out and regards the Shiva Farms as occupied Syrian territory, while Lebanon and Syria have stated they regard the area as Lebanese territory. On September 3rd, 2004, the National Assembly voted to amend the Constitution to allow the pro-Syrian president, Emile Lahoud, three more years in office by extending a statute of limitations to nine years. Many regarded this as the second time Syria had pressured Lebanon's parliament to amend the Constitution in a way that favored Lahoud. Three cabinet ministers were absent from the vote and later resigned. The USA charged that Syria exercised pressure against the National Assembly to amend the Constitution, and many of the Lebanese rejected it, saying that it was considered as contradictive to the Constitution and its principles. On October 7th, the UN Secretary General Kofi Annan reported to the Security Council that Syria had failed to withdraw its forces from Lebanon. 
Mr. Annan concluded by stating that it is time 14 years after the end of hostilities and four years after the Israeli withdrawal from Lebanon for all parties concerned to set aside the remaining vestiges of the past. The withdrawal of foreign forces and the disbandment and disarmament of militias would finally end that sad chapter of Lebanese history. On October 19th, following the UN Secretary General's report, the UN Security Council voted unanimously to put out a statement calling on Syria to pull its troops out of Lebanon in accordance with Resolution 1559. On March 5th, Syrian leader Assad declared in a televised speech that Syria would withdraw its forces to the Beka Valley in eastern Lebanon and then to the border between Syria and Lebanon. Assad did not provide a timetable for a complete withdrawal of Syrian forces from Lebanon, 14,000 soldiers and intelligence agents. Later in the same month, an enormous anti-Syrian rally gathered at Mortis Square in Beirut. Multiple news agencies estimated the crowd at between 800,000 and 1 million, a show of force for the Sunni Muslim, Christian and Druze communities. The rally was double the size of the mostly Shiite pro-Syrian one organized by Hezbollah the previous week. So the Seder revolution was triggered by the assassination of ex-Prime Minister Harari in February 2005. And the popular movement was remarkable for its avoidance of violence, peaceful approach and its total reliance on methods of civil resistance. Its aims were the withdrawal of Syrian troops from Lebanon and the replacement of a government heavily influenced by Syrian interest with more independent leadership. Then the establishment of an international commission to investigate the assassination of Prime Minister Harari. Thirdly, the resignation of security officials to ensure the success of the plan and the organization of free parliamentary elections Daily protests against the Syrian occupation attracted 25,000 people, while in the 90s, most anti-Syrian demonstrations were predominantly Christian and were put down by force. The new demonstrations were distinctly non-sectarian, meaning they were comprised of all elements of the Lebanese demographic, and the government did not respond with force for, or intimidation. On February 28th, the government of pro-Syrian Prime Minister Omar Karami resigned, calling for a new election to take place. Karami said in his announcement, I am keen the government will not be a hurdle in front of those who want the good for this country. The tens of thousands gathered at Beirut's Martyrs Square cheered the announcement Then chanted, Karami has fallen, your turn will come, Lahoud and yours, Bashar. Opposition MPs were not satisfied with only Karami's resignation and kept pressing for full Syrian withdrawal. On March 23rd, Michel Abouaraj, the Lebanese magistrate responsible for the internal Lebanese investigation of the assassination, asked to be excused citing a heavy court schedule. The Judicial Council of Lebanon was expected to rule on his request for the next day. He re his resignation and the consequent need to replace him raised the possibility of a delay in the investigation. On the anniversary of the ignition of the Lebanese civil war, the last remaining Syrian troops left Lebanon ending the 30-year presence. During the Sedar revolution, Hezbollah organized a series of pro-Syrian rallies. He became part of the Lebanese government following the 2005 elections. On November 2005, 
Hezbollah launched an attack along the entire border with Israel, the heaviest in the five and a half years since Israel's withdrawal. The UN accused Hezbollah of initiating the hostilities with Israel. Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Olmert described the seizure of the soldiers as an act of war by the sovereign state of Lebanon, stating that Lebanon will hear the consequences of its actions and promising a very painful and far-reaching response. Israel blamed the Lebanese government for the raid as it was carried out from Lebanese territory. Hezbollah had two ministers serving in the Lebanese cabinet at the time. In response, the Lebanese Prime Minister Fuad Sinoria denied any knowledge of the raid and stated that he did not condone it. An emergency meeting of the Lebanese government reaffirmed this position. During the war, the Lebanese armed forces did not engage in direct hostilities, but threatened retaliation if IDF troops pushed too far northward into Lebanon. In several instances, Lebanese troops fired anti-aircraft weapons at Israeli aircraft and attempted to disrupt landing operations. On August 2006, the United Nations Security Council unanimously approved UN Security Council Resolution 1701 to end the hostilities. It was accepted by the Lebanese government and Hezbollah on the 12th of August 2006 and by the Israeli government the next day. The ceasefire took effect on the 14th. In 2012, the Syrian civil war threatened to spill over into the Lebanon due to the geopolitical links between the countries, leading to heightened secretarian violence in Lebanon that was akin to that of the Lebanese civil war several decades earlier. As of the 6th of August 2013, more than 600,000 Syrian refugees are in Lebanon. As the number of Syrian refugees increases, the Lebanese Forces Party, the Katyeb Party and the Free Patriotic Movement fear the country's sectarian-based political system is being undermined. So that's all for this video. If you found this useful, give it a thumbs up and do subscribe to our channel where we offer free materials that you can use as part of your studies. To really get a better grasp of specific areas you might find challenging. Make sure to visit our website where you'll find useful revision guides, model answers and tools to get top marks. Thank you for listening!